have the pleasure to open the second part of the afternoon session, focusing on uh, reading France in different languages. Uh, we have uh, one of the speakers that will not come, unfortunately, for some reason that we ignore. Then we have, uh, in this session, we have uh, two speakers. And I have the pleasure to uh, call uh, my colleague and uh, friend, uh, Dr. Anna Prino, to give her talk. Thank you. to you today is part of Rita Zadson Kulik's um, PhD dissertation, mm -hmm. and it's in collaboration um, with Tami Katsil. And, ah, <laughs> very dark. Um, and probably when I went into collaboration of Tami, I should have imagined that it would end up being about fluency, but really that was not um, the aim of the project to begin with. Um, and this was a project looking at reading comprehension. That was our goal. That was how it designed. But at some point, it took on a life of its own and ended up in um, unexpected places. Um, OK. OK. So um, this really is a developmental study. And I want to start from an anchor point of reading comprehension development in L1 and the predictors that predict um, reading comprehension across um, ages. This is a very nice study that came out in 2009, looking at fourth, seventh, and ninth grade students um, reading in English. And what you can see, I want to point your attention to two things. First of all, um, the purple bars of decoding, their um, importance decreases with age. And the second part I want you to look up at is the very top, the reading fluency part, is kind of increasing its role in um, predicting reading comprehension in this population. Um, this is another. Um, set of findings, again, from um, English reading children. These are younger children. These are second graders. This is work by Alessandro Gotardo. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. Um, I'm not sure if you can read all the, um, the labels, but basically what she found is that for um, second grade reading comprehension, the predictors are very much aligned with the simple view of reading. So she finds a very strong role for word reading and for English oral language proficiency in this population. Um, and these are kind of the building blocks that we took with us into the study. So looking at reading comprehension in both languages of our population and asking about the predictors and more importantly, how they develop over time. Um, and this is a slide I shamelessly lifted from Estel Geva because I think it's wonderful. Um, and what she has here is the basic um, model of reading comprehension. And she's added, so the yellow parts on the side are her additions. Um, and first of all, she makes the point that it is a multi-dimensional process that is influenced by many different things. Um, if you look at the very top here, you kind of get back to the simple view of reading. So we have the language comprehension and the decoding. But um, what Esther adds to this is that um, there are other things that matter, especially if we're looking at second language. So first language skills matter. The type of L1 matters, just like we heard from Malt for spelling. I think it's important for reading comprehension as well. And age matters, because things change over time. Now, a lot of the work on second language reading comprehension has been conducted on children who are immersed in the second language, so mainly immigrant populations. A lot of this has been done um, in Canada by Linda Siegel and Esther Geva, and there are um, groups working on this in the United States. And like a lot of research on reading and reading comprehension, most of it focuses on younger readers. So we saw Orly's work today moving up to the, to the seventh grade. Um, but a lot of the work really focuses on the earlier stages of reading acquisition and developing reading comprehension. And we know less about what happens afterwards until we get to adults. And adults, we know a lot. But kind of the adolescent high school years are a little bit neglected um, in this research domain. And again, mostly people, because most of the researchers in this domain live or work in English-speaking country, countries, a lot of the research uh, looks at English as a second language. And not all of it, and in recent years less, because we see you know, research into 
native Chinese speakers in other languages, but a lot of the early work really looked at speakers of other Indo-European languages as an L1 and what happens when they come into English. So what we did, we tried to take you know, all of these things together and kind of look a little bit outside of this defined world. We looked at adolescents here in Israel, and um, we looked at their performance in Hebrew, their native language, and in English, which they study as a foreign language in school. So this is very different from um, the situation that a language learner finds themselves following immigration. So the amount of exposure is massively different. Children here get between three and five hours of instruction weekly in a foreign language. The type of exposure is very different. The kind of foundation of oral language that learners bring with them to the task of acquiring literacy and acquiring comprehension are very different. Um, and one of the big questions within the L2 world generally, and this came up very nicely in our, at the end of our last session, is how much of this is universal and how much of reading, spelling, comprehending strategies really is based specifically or shaped by the specific language um, that, that we are looking here. And in the, in the domain of reading comprehension, this might lead to the question, will the predictors of comprehension be different for the two languages? So with reading <coughs> comprehension in Hebrew, really sh somehow shaped differently than in English. And this is very, this corresponds, I think, very nicely with the data that Linda showed us this morning, that fluency isn't, or, and, and comprehension isn't really the same for readers of different languages. Um, so kind of a snapshot about Hebrew and English. At the very kind of basic superficial level, the reading direction is different. Um, both orthographies are deep, but for different reasons. So we've heard a lot about the freak, inconsistent English orthography. Hebrew is deep because the vowel information is missing for skilled readers. It's just not represented. Um, and if you think of the distinctions made by Ram Frost, he says that Decoding and reading in English is orthography based, whereas really reading in Hebrew and in Arabic is morphology based. So really the, the, the task of the reader is to extract the morphological information from, from the written message. Um, so kind of another, I think, interesting aspect for us in this project is that we have individuals who are at different levels of development in their two languages. So if we look at adolescents here in Israel, they've been you know, practicing literacy and reading in Hebrew for six, seven, eight years, but they're newer to English and they've had less exposure. So we can look kind of at a developmental snapshot that gives us two points in time in the same person, which I think is really neat. Um, and the other part is, you know, when we look towards instruction and English instruction in Israel, I think foreign language instruction generally is a big issue because in many places it doesn't work very well. If we can successfully identify the predictors of, of you know, um, better acquisition of reading comprehension as opposed to the places where um, we have difficulty, it can help us tailor our instruction um, methods um, so, they're, so they are more successful. Okay, so going into this research, we really had kind of three big questions. First of all, we wanted to ask this kind of universal question. Are reading comprehension correlated for people who are comprehending text in two languages. So if you have good comprehension in Hebrew, will you necessarily have good comprehension in English? And from this, um, kind of the, the underlying question is, can we find unbalanced people? So who are, have really proficient comprehension in one language, but not so much in the other? That was the first research question. The second research question was really to look at the developmental trajectory, but within this kind of later time window. So we're comparing middle school students and high school students, and the question is, you know, is there still anything developmentally interesting going on um, in that age group? And our prediction was because they are earlier in the process of acquiring <coughs> English, we expected to see more growth within that time window for the language that they are um, still acquiring to a greater degree. And finally, we wanted to answer again, going back to this universal and unique question, what are the predictors of successful comprehension in each of the languages, and are they similar or perhaps different? Okay, our participants, um, it was a cross-sectional design, and Rita and a wonderful group of um, research assistants, some of whom are here, 
um, heroically tested 100 eighth graders and 117 um, 11th graders in the school. And these students have been studying English mostly from the third grade, um, building up first kind of basic vocabulary. They start out with the young kids with songs and rhymes and color names and then um, gradually building up the, the rhythm system as well. So the eighth graders have been studying English for five years more or less and the 11th graders um, for three additional years. And um, we had a whole battery of parallel measures in the two languages. So we had, some of them had been developed, some by Tami Kutsir and Rachel Schiff for a previous um, study. Some of them we really, Rita, worked very, um, um, very, uh, very hard <laughs> on developing the, the parallel uh, measures for Hebrew and English. So we had reading comprehension, phonological processing, uh, morphological awareness, word reading accuracy tasks, fluency, of course, and vocabulary um, as well. Okay, so first, our first question uh, was regarding are these skills correlated across the languages? And you see that they are. So when we plot uh, reading comprehension in Hebrew on the x-axis and reading comprehension in English on the y-axis, you see that generally a good comprehender is a good comprehender. And we can later think about why that is, but in the, the pattern emerging from our data was that there was a, a pretty nice correlation between comprehension performance in the two languages. And this led us to our second question, can we still, within this kind of general um, display of the population, find readers who really are not at the same place in the two languages, so who are doing much better in one of them than the other? Um, and what you see here, these are the middle schoolers. So the blue and the red are the children who have kind of the same profile in both languages. So the majority of the kids are, that we set the cutoff for proficient at the 25, 25th percentile and above. So most kids are doing fine in both languages. Some, the red, um, the red slice, are really not, not proficient in either of their languages. But if you look at the green and the yellow, we have these, and this, um, together they give us 25% of the population, which is a nice, good chunk of the population. And they're equally divided between those who are proficient comprehenders in Hebrew and having difficulty in English, which might be you know, the pattern we would expect, but we also have the opposite pattern. So people who are children who are kind of at the lower side of the distribution in Hebrew, but are seeming to do pretty well in English. Okay, and this is data for the middle schoolers. Um, the proficiency we set at 25th percentile. Within the back? Yes. Below is poor and above is proficient. And I just want to say that these norms, so these, um, we based it on the population distribution that we tested. None of these um, tools have norms for English as a foreign language. So it wouldn't make any sense to look at, you know, eighth grade norms for English speaking children. One of the goals of this project is also to develop kind of tools for assessment of English as a foreign language because it's not, I mean, it's, it's different. Um, in high school, overall, the, 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 the picture is pretty similar, okay? So we still find almost 20% of the kids were showing this unbalanced profile in their comprehension. And we looked, and it's not that they were, you know, at 24th percentile in English and at the 27th percentile in Hebrew, and it's just a function of the cutoff. There were really kids that had a significant disparity, so they were really not performing well in one language but seemed fine in the other. <coughs> Now the second issue we wanted to look at was the developmental <coughs> trajectories um, in the subskills. So both in the comprehension itself, but also in all the other linguistic and, and literacy measures that we looked at. And um, again, I remind you that our prediction was that we would see more happening in English because they still have a longer way to go until um, they would achieve skilled reading. <coughs> and what we're plotting here are the differences. So the percent change between middle school and high school, it wasn't a longitudinal design, it's cross-sectional, but we compared across the two groups. And, you, and the red bars are showing the change for English and the blue bars are showing the change for Hebrew. And at a first glance, you can see that it seems the case that they are progressing more in English. And part of it could be that they're just further away from ceiling, so there's more for them um, to progress in. But it wasn't uniform across all the measures. And I wanna draw your attention to two important things. First of all, look at the fluency, the <coughs> single word fluency, 
they're actually improving <coughs> to the same degree in Hebrew and in English. And these, you know, these are middle schoolers. We would expect them to be doing pretty well in Hebrew, and there's still there's room for improvement in high school. And the other thing is it's cut off a bit, but the second one from the right is the reading comprehension. And there they're actually making more gains in Hebrew, okay, in this um, shift from eighth uh, to the eleventh grade. And the huge jump is in English morphology. And one of the things we think about that is that in eighth grade, they're not really, they haven't gotten enough exposure to really build up the morphological patterns in a very consistent way. And these three added years of exposure really help that system kind of come on board. So we do see overall more gains in English as a foreign language, as I said, especially in the morphology. We see similar gains in fluency, but comprehension is still develops more strongly in the native language. Okay. Now the final question, and here's where the fluency will come into place, is what are the predictors of comprehension across these two languages and across um, the two age groups? Um, so in middle school, this is um, predicting English reading comprehension, and we again have the classic simple view of reading. Okay, so we have a large chunk of the variability being explained by, the, by their vocabulary knowledge, an additional um, significant portion of the variance explained by decoding, specifically <coughs> non-word decoding. What we see in Hebrew is, um, first of all, I want you to see that we're not doing a very good job at all of predicting reading comprehension in Hebrew for kind of adolescent, for high school, for adolescent and, and more skilled readers. This is a pattern that's come up now in several studies. We're kind of scratching our head about it. We're not really sure what else we need to put in there to be able to understand individual variability in reading comprehension. But again, we have the vocabulary, we have the decoding, and we have a big chunk of the variability that is driven by morphological knowledge. And again, if you kind of look at models of reading in Hebrew, that's not too surprising because you know Hebrew is all about the morphology. All the action, everything interesting is, is going on in the morphology. And in fact, things that in other languages might be captured by vocabulary in Hebrew would actually be captured by morphological knowledge. So this is the picture in middle school. And in high school, ta -da, what we see is fluency taking over. So we're explaining a similar amount of variability in reading comprehension in English. And there's you know, still a, a, a role for vocabulary, but really what's driving these individual differences at this point in age is the fluency, single word fluency. And in Hebrew, we see the exact same predictors. They're just not doing very well in predicting. But it's the same components <laughs> coming into play. So you know, kind of thinking back to this universal unique, the picture in middle school looks kind of different across the two languages, especially in the sense of which factors are involved. Whereas by the time they're in high school, we're seeing more of a similar pattern um, in which subskills kind of contribute <coughs> to to reading comprehension. Okay, so as I said, you know, all, re all roads lead us to fluency, and we're seeing a, sh a developmental shift in both languages where in English, kind of what was formerly captured or in middle school was captured by um, vocabulary is now being driven by fluency, and in Hebrew we kind of see more um, fluency taking over the role um, previously um, played by morphology. So to kind of summarize and, and uh, share with you where we're thinking, because this is very much still a, a project in progress and we would appreciate your thoughts and suggestions, we do see that similar skills kind of come into reading comprehension across the two languages and this leads us back to you know, thoughts of universal shared linguistic um, skills that can really serve um, readers or language users across their two language systems. Um, and we see continuing development in this kind of neglected, they should be fine by now age group in both the languages. So we see development in fluency, in vocabulary, in comprehension um, during this time from middle school to high school. And I think for us, when we think about teaching and intervention, it's not early, as Shelly said this morning, but there's still room for improvement and there's still a lot that we can do. Um, what we also see is the growing role for fluency in both the languages. And I think that kind of complements very nicely the data that we heard about 
this morning. And our thinking at this point is that, and I think again this kind of echoes things that have been uh, said over the last three days, is that fluency can maybe be conceptualized as a higher order skill. And that really in order to be able to um, read fluently, you rely on all these different components. And that's why with greater development, you really see that fluency is replacing the other skills as kind of a, um, uh, a higher order skill that really gives you, uh, is driving comprehension. Um, and reading comprehension in Hebrew, we're still stumped. Mm -hmm. So some of it I think is that our tools, because they're very new tools, are not very good. We don't yet, I think, have a very good vocabulary measure. We're not sure that you know our reading comprehension assessment tools are really as good as they should be. But I think, I don't know, my intuition is that it's not just about the tools, that there's something here that we're not capturing yet with kind of the standard battery of sub-skills that we're looking at, and we'd be very happy for any um, insight into this issue. Thank you. She's ready for questions? <laughs> In two languages. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, while Amal told us about the magic of spelling, mm -hmm. you know, the mystery of... <laughs> <laughs> um, I have only one, one suggestion. Uh, the most interesting subgroup, from my point of view, is those 30% who are poor in their native language? 15%. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I can. Who are poor in their native language and good in the foreign <coughs> language. And perhaps uh, in using these subgroups and, and looking for their cognitive functioning um, beside the comprehension process gives you some hint of the mystery. Mm -hmm. So we're. we're Definitely looking into that. One of our thoughts about this issue is that because really the, the orthographies are so different, it might be that they play differently to your strengths. So if you happen to be very um, geared towards being good at morphology, it will really help you in Hebrew. It's not going to do that much for you in English. And as opposed to that, if you have a very good orthographic memory system or a very good visual processing system, it might really help you in English not going to do that much for you in Hebrew. And so one of the things we're considering is looking kind of at the profiles mm -hmm. of these differential performing groups and see whether we can map that in any interesting way to the language typology. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you have any information or can you tell us a little bit how English is taught? Because the something like the morphology in, uh, in English classes, in Canada, for example, they don't teach very much about morphology. Mm -hmm. But if they did, it might make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And um, so in my experience with foreign language teaching in most of the places in the world, that it's not very good. And it, it may be better here. Um, but I doubt that. But I'll, I'll <laughs> let me take that question because she's um, much more, she's actually an English teacher. So she's <laughs> Isn't much special on the uh, morphology in the Israeli uh, system. It is it is taught, yes, but stresses put um, on vocabulary, on uh, grammar, taught analytically, a little bit out of context or in context, but not not in a natural way. Uh, a lot of reading, reading comprehension, most of the exposure is uh, is done uh, through uh, the written form. Word. Uh, there isn't much work on um, communicative uh, skills, just not only. Uh, writing is uh, important. Spelling, spelling, uh, spelling is mostly um, tested, but not taught. And, and the way the, the orthography is done is, is a little bit um, uh, uh, superficial because the basic, basic code is taught uh, well and then kind of the rest is ignored. So um, learners are expected to fill in um, the rest by themselves. Uh, 
that's kind of uh, general terms. The sounds as well. Yeah, it just sounds like the way we learn French. <laughs> I think it's not a or no. Spanish or it's a very language. foreign language type instruction situation, which I think is common in many places. Mm -hmm. But one thing is, they if they, they start in third grade. One would think that they would do more interesting things than right. trying to teach one them. One would think. <laughs> <laughs> I think paradoxically, you know, from uh, uh, perspectives of younger is better in language learning, and we're still a conversation that's going on. You would have thought that they would give in many hours in the younger years, and then few. It's not the case, though. So they start out with two or three hours a week, and then by the time you're in high school, you're doing four or five um, hours mm -hmm. a week um, of language. So there is room for. <laughs> well, one comment on it. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about the reading comprehension. Did you try to look uh, um, and split by the reader group? So if you're looking on reading comprehension, uh, skill, or regression, to look on the good, uh, the good one and the poor ones, or try to see if this will bring you a different story because it might mask. Yeah. yeah. We're looking at that. We're, we're th so this is a very rich data set. We're still kind of thinking of the best ways of, of dealing with it all. We're thinking of doing some structural equation modeling and, and definitely looking also <coughs> at, at subgroups to see if that gives us some interesting stories. Definitely. And the other one I will encourage, I, I will be very, very happy to see with the play of the fluency as dependent and independent. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually also, we have a lot of data here, and we're, we're also building models to predict word reading in both mm -hmm. of the languages and see what feeds into that. So as a first step, and then taking it. So yeah, there's, Rita has a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nobody talks about me, so I will talk about myself. Uh, Surya is very uh, modest. We just have completed, she gave me the data, and we have submitted the paper uh, where we tested SVR in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And uh, from grades two through 10, right, Svea? Two through 10 or two through 12. And uh, we find uh, the decoding and listening comprehension can explain about somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of the variance, uh, uh, depending on the grading. Mm -hmm. And so we did the structural equation modeling. And you're using listening comprehension. Yes. I think our vocabulary tools are really bad. Really, really, really bad. And yeah. one of the things we're thinking of here is trying to improve. Yeah, I don't know Hebrew, so Leah gave me the data. <laughs> <laughs> if it's wrong, it's not a <laughs> Okay, thank you very much.